an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. Good morning, sports fans. Bruce is away from the microphone this Saturday morning. This is Wayne Viner, along with Danny Cadu behind the glass. Mason Viner, to my left. How you doing this morning, Mason? Well, tired would be one word for it, and good would be another. Good and tired. That's a way to start the morning. Uh, today, we are going to talk NFL. We got the Ravens. I'm going to talk some Orioles rebuild, little Caps news, of course, some Maryland stuff. Later in the show, we have sports architect Eric Einhorn joining us from Ball Parkitecture. And Todd Carton checks in on the fall sports scene in College Park. But we are going to lead off today with uh, the Ravens and looking at the uh, first release of the depth chart. And there's a few things that I think really jump out at me that's going to make the preseason it might make the Ravens an absolute preseason star and I'm going to start at the top with the quarterback Flacco as has been noted obviously the starter RG3 listed as number two Lamar Jackson is number three and when they go into a game like they're going to do on August 2nd against the Bears the whole NFL world is going to be waiting to see Jackson And a lot of fans from around here after that uh, RG3 superstar run with the Redskins are going to see if RG3 has anything left. Mason, you've been watching RG3 since he wore Superman socks back at Baylor because you love that type of offense, (laughs) even though it doesn't translate well to the NFL. RG3 have anything in the tank, in your opinion? Maybe he can give them something, but I don't really think there's a lot there. If you get into a late-season situation where they're really going downhill, then maybe he gets some snaps and a chance to prove himself again. But you got to think he had that chance with the Browns, even though they're the Browns. But he could have shown something there. And he did. He showed he could still get injured just like the best of them. But with Lamar Jackson, I mean, if they say he's going to play the second half, there's a chance a lot of people are going to turn on the TV for the second half kickoff and skip the first half. Even though I'm not sure that he's actually scheduled to play this year, I want to see what this guy has. I know it'll be a limited offense. When you talk about a limited offense for somebody like a Lamar Jackson, what do you expect to see when he hits the field? Well, in this first game is probably the only that I'm going to expect the limits for because Louisville played more of a pro style than any other team that we've seen this spread quarterback, athletic quarterback come out of. So they're going to look to get him some quick throws, get him in a rhythm, and then maybe as the game progresses going into the fourth quarter, if he's still in, they'll try and open it up just to see if he can really manage. When I watched him, the thing you watched for like watching a younger Michael Vick or even an RG3 was really when the play broke down and he took off, he he becomes electric, especially if you're going to play man defense down the field where all the defensive backs turn and run with the receivers. If you can break through the first five, six, seven pass rushers, pass the linebackers, this guy could go the distance. With the propensity, and I'm going to use RG3 as the model, that once he got hit by Nada, when the Redskins played the Ravens so many years ago, he got hit really hard. He was never the same. People said you can't run the quarterback like that. That hit that he took was a scramble off a pass play. It wasn't a designed run. You tell like somebody like a Lamar Jackson to not do that, don't risk your livelihood? Well, what I've seen from Robert Griffin III and Lamar Jackson is there is a difference. RG3 runs like a track star. Big strides, exposed legs, it really exposes the knee to direct hits. Lamar Jackson runs like a football player. Quick, agile, keeps the legs really close together, keeps them close to the body to absorb the impacts. So I don't, I'm interested to see if the same injuries will affect Lamar Jackson because of the different running style. On Wednesday's show, you brought up your fascination with Orlando Brown that you said fell to the Ravens as a third-round pick when you were talking to Dennis. Yeah, And now he's getting, or has taken, all the first-team reps at right tackle because he's filling in, I guess, Yonda's out. 
Um, that would be a heck of a pickup if he could actually well, play at the NFL level. That was Jordan that was talking about Orlando Brown. Okay. And he is an Oklahoma guy. There, you know, there are question marks with the kind of offense that a team like Oklahoma runs. Because? Well, it's not a pro style offense, it's a spread, it's a open space concept offense, really just a concept offense, not many set plays. All right. Is it the type of offense where the offensive linemen have their hand in the dirt, or are they doing the wide it's a, spread? It's a wide stance offense. But when a guy's playing tackle, the hand in the dirt, you can live without the hand in the dirt. Okay. But for Orlando Brown going into these first few preseason games, since he had a terrible combine that made him fall in the draft, since he's from an offense that people have question marks about, the first few preseason games, when he's going to get his chance, are probably some of the biggest football games that he's played. Okay, so you sound positive on Orlando Brown, even though you don't like that standard of well, offense. Well, yeah, I, there is a lot of positives there. Before the combine, he was expected to go in the first round. So you got him in the third round, you took a chance on him, or a, you know, kind of the way these NFL teams like to... As soon as you have a bad combine, you go down two rounds. Right. That kind of chance. The football, the tape still told a good story. Okay. but he And he fell because? He went out in the combine. His numbers were way lower than expected. Okay. But it's not a character issue thing. I no, mean, we, it's We've not. talked, no. not on the air, but we've talked offline about uh, Darius Geis, who the Redskins ended up with and looks like it'll be their starter. And he had different types of issues. And I'm going to find this fascinating if Darius Geis, who was at LSU, ends up being better than average and having Matt Canada, who was his coach last year at LSU, now the offensive coordinator at Maryland. It could be a lot of fun for some offline questions about how good was Darius Geis really in college and how does he compare to these Maryland guys like a Ty Johnson. But I'm getting off schedule there. So you don't find problems with Brown coming from Oklahoma, and I know that you, was it you or Jordan? I I didn't say that. Ooh, well, what about Baker Mayfield? Look, I don't have a problem with the Browns taking Baker Mayfield. He was, in my opinion, on the level of any other quarterback you could have taken. Because they weren't that spectacular. Well, Sam Darnold had turnover problems when they played against the Big Ten defenses, the SEC defenses. Josh Rosen... Character concerns for me. I don't really know how the NFL executive... Character because you don't think he really wants to play football? There's a possibility he's not in love with football? Yeah. That, that is a problem for me as a Why? He's a pro football quarterback. You spend millions of dollars and invest your whole team. What's the problem if the guy doesn't seem to actually like football? Josh Allen, who went to the Bills, is looking already somewhat bust-ish as he's taking third-string snaps and struggling right now in Bills training camp. Okay. who Do you know offhand... Who the first two guys are right now for the Bills? I don't. I, I don't. I'm know. assuming it's Nathan Peterman and someone and Allen. someone else. Who? Allen, the, the first round pick, right? right? Is now third. I'm. I don't. Okay, moving on here. Yeah. Nathan Peterman, the man, yeah, the Nathan interception Peterman. machine that uh, Pitt product. So there. maybe getting rid of Tyrod wasn't the best idea. Maybe no, not, not the best idea. A tight end, Nick Boyle for the Ravens, jumps to the top of the list. He's supposedly been looking great in training camp. I haven't, I don't know, ever since Dennis Pitta for the Ravens, tight end's been whoever they can find and plug in there. Right, and who doesn't get injured and can live through a season. Um, Your receivers, Crabtree, pretty big NFL name, John Brown, and Willie Sneed. The Willie Sneed move... I thought was the best one that they made because I thought he was really something. Now, that was with Drew Brees in oh. New Orleans. And then the his value dropped, so they did get him on a favorable contract because of, was it a PED suspension that he took last year? And with John Brown and Michael Crabtree, you kind of were able to rebuild your receivers through free agency, giving Flacco some deep threats and some other guys that can just make plays like Crabtree. Mm-hmm. On the defensive backfield side, Brashad Breland, which was a Clemson product, played for the Redskins for a couple of years. He's coming in today, Danny? Yeah, apparently he's coming in for a meeting at, at, at camp, and the Ravens have precious little cap space, but there are very intriguing people still out there on the market that might be uh, falling into camp uh, over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Did the Redskins think about paying Breland? No. The answer from the organization and Jay Gruden has been, no, they really, 
They talked with him a few times. The numbers just weren't right. And ever since then, even though you could probably get him on that veteran minimum at this point, they just they have not shown any interest in bringing now, him Both of you would know him a lot better, but uh, the, the problem with the Ravens right now is that you have Weddle, who has a decreasing uh, space that he can cover on the field, and then you have Jefferson, who his entire career until last year, when Dean Pease tried to make him into a center field safety, is more of a middle-of-the-box glorified linebacker. So how do you feel like Breland would complement those two as an extra option on safety? And, and you were talking about Tony Jefferson? Yeah. Well, he had a couple picks yesterday. I don't know exactly how he got them. <laughs> well, it is camp. It is camp. So, I mean, it's it's not... I like the idea of having a run-stopping safety until the offense figures that out and then matches them up on your tailback or something and lights them up. Absolutely. And that NFL guys are too smart. But the idea of having that hybrid linebacker, which uh, the Redskins had one in Sua Cravens, Maryland has one in... Antoine Brooks. And the best one in the league right now is playing for the Cardinals, where Tony Jefferson came right. from, which would be Dante Buchanan. Exactly. And, and the Ravens also have a guy that named Anthony Levine, who's been mostly toiling away in uh, in special teams, who people have been dying to give an opportunity to be a... I mean, they want to line him up at the linebacker position, but he's historically been a safety. They feel like that sort of uh, athleticism covering the pass on mm-hmm. the linebackers is going to be worth it. Well, uh, back to Breland as a safety... He played corner his whole life, yeah. and he, he managed to get burned. He's a guy that had a propensity to give up the big play, which is why I guess the Redskins wanted to pass on that. I mean, Safety's well, a different play. Go ahead, Mason. Talking about him giving up the big play is, you could look back at the past three years when he's been a two for the Redskins, always the second cornerback. Look at every big pass catch picture that they have. Des Bryant making that catch in the corner of the end zone that really put the Redskins out one year. Odell Beckham in the Redskins-Giants game that knocked the Redskins out of the playoffs. They're all against Breland. So He's posterized several times. Yes, posterized. <laughs> so as a safety, it's I, a I di- really different like responsibilities. I, well, I don't, but we didn't have... Okay, you go to a zone and the safety's playing the back line, right. and you got a guy who's known for being posterized, burned, whatever you want to call it. Do you want that guy playing safety well, for you? He had a Final lot of hubris defense. up at the line of scrimmage. He was going to play with you. He was going to take that chance. As a safety, there isn't. You're not supposed to be taking big chances. You are the last line of defense. I think it's a different mindset to play safety. There's a lot of guys that were okay corners that extended their careers by playing safety. In the end, they're football players. Well, that would really compel me if they do stick them back there, because you're talking about a guy who loved playing on the line of scrimmage, loved getting up in people's face. Now that's not his job anymore. So. How would that work? I know you just said they're football players at the end of the day, but Breland's whole persona was, I'm going to get up in your face and me and Josh Norman are going to play straight up man coverage on you. How is that going to change? Well, my impression is the guy needs a job and you need NFL experienced players. And I don't think that his goal in life was to become an NFL safety. He wanted to be a top cover corner and it hasn't exactly worked out. And the fact that he's coming into the Ravens now, where he went to Kansas City, he's tried to get a job before. He didn't just leave the Redskins and come to the Ravens. So this, I think he's going to have to come up that the reality in his mind is maybe I'm not going to end up being the cover corner that I had hoped to be, and we're going to have to get, uh, get on with the program here. Is that a risk to take somebody who might not want that job? Yeah, sure. but there's only limited people out there at this point. Right. I mean, if you've... Throw him out there and say, I need to cover a tight end that broke loose that we didn't really account for. Can you do that? Yeah, he has the skills to cover that. We're not asking him to cover Des well, Bryant I, anymore. I always thought he was a great skill player. I really did think that there was a lot of potential there. Right. But it just didn't work out in Washington. So it's okay. So he moves it's time on. to move on. You're, he moves on. You're right. Uh, but a lot of these pickups and where these guys really can play, I think, makes this a and the fact that I get the feeling that it's a season on the brink. If this doesn't go well, there's going to be a lot of changes. And the the timeline, the sands of time have run out on maybe we'll get this right next time. Uh, so this is the most of a fascinating preseason for me. I think that the Ravens and maybe the 49ers to see if uh, – Janine Garofalo really can play quarterback or whether that was just a... We're barely going to see him in the preseason at all. They, they, I feel like they know what they're getting from him. He's going to play a couple quarters and and sit the rest of the preseason. At least we'll get to see Lamar a ton here. I'm, yes. Isn't that exciting? Finally. It is. 
I, I, I want to go see this guy. Yeah, Bruce was mentioning that last week on the show, is that it really genuinely feels like for a show that, and, and we've all been on the show for a couple of years now at least, and the show's been running a lot longer than that, but like, it's been a longstanding tradition that we crap all over the preseason. Well, it sh- yeah, it should not exist. It should not that. exist. However, everyone in this room, and including Bruce, who's here in spirit. <laughs> uh, he, every, Bruce every, is still alive. He's right, just he is still alive. That's right. That's right. I thought about that for a second. <laughs> but it, it does feel like everyone's genuinely excited for this preseason to at least usher in are, this new era in Baltimore football. Are you smiling? Uh, with the Ravens for the first time in about a year and a half, I think so. Wearing an Orioles shirt, smiling. You know, well, think this is a different year. It's a different year. No. I think the the teams. Okay, so maybe Garoppolo doesn't play that much in the preseason. Does Kirk uh, Cousins play for the Vikings? How much do you think you're gonna see him and Diggs? Well, the words that have been coming out of the Vikings camp is it's looking rough right now between Cousins, Thielen, Diggs, and Kyle Rudolph, which were the big three targets for him to throw. At, so I do assume that they will put him out there in the preseason, just enough to see if they can get some things figured out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys heard the news story coming out of uh, Redskins camp that uh, they were making fun of Josh Norman uh, because he wasn't getting as many interceptions this year. He's like, hey, you know, uh, Cousins isn't throwing to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I mean, I'm curious about how you guys feel about that as 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 Washington supporters about how is this uh, era of new optimism or do you guys miss Kurt already? Or I'm sorry, sorry, Kirk. Um, I don't want to sound, yeah, I don't yeah. want to sound like you, the GM, you, Bruce, Bruce Allen. Bruce, Bruce <laughs> Allen? Sorry, yeah. there. Um, no, I do not miss him at all. He burned the bridges. He, yeah. he sailed for Minnesota. Oh. And, well, who and burned was, the bridge first? Let's well, be real. I think it was him. Yeah? I think that there was a point where he got to the too cute level. Okay. Like, with the, you like that, and then whatever <laughs> else that he said, I don't even remember anymore. And they made t-shirts about it, and he's all over Facebook with his kids, and I don't really have a problem with that. It's when you're seem like you're always putting that over the team where you're making jokes about the people in the organization, selling stuff about it. I just didn't like him. It got to that. Mason point. Viner slams Kirk Cousins kids. Uh, yeah. Film at 11. Check back <laughs> with your local listings. So I don't miss him. I'm still I think he's a type of guy that off was throwing to a spot. Yeah. And if everything worked out and the timing was there, the guy was deadly. When he had to make plays, which happens late in games, and that's why the early game success, he'd get 300 yards, and you put him out there to win the game, and gosh darn it, didn't work again this week. <laughs> you, see, you go, why? Because it broke down and you had to improvise, and he's not the best impro- uh, improvisational quarterback. Absolutely. I think that Jay Gruden is great at that. Making a guy... Andy Dalton? Andy <laughs> Dalton, yeah. Because then he goes to a guy like Ken Zampezi that they brought in at the end of the year, uh, at the beginning of this last season, and they're 0-3 and they didn't even score a touchdown. And that's the Bengals. Yeah, this is the Bengals. Yeah. Right. So, so Jay Gruden's great at making a quarterback look right. like $34 million. As As we had to break here, my other note is, are the Rams actually any good really quick here? Ooh, they are in that prime. We signed everybody, and we're going <laughs> to completely just... Lose, yeah. Uh, Eagles. What year was that? The Eagles did that with every. Oh, with Demarco Murray and and Lashawn McCoy and uh, who was the third that they brought? Oh, in? they brought Sproles? in the quarterback from Texas. Who won the national championship at Texas? Vince Young. Oh, oh yeah, that's 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 right. super he, team. Was, he was part of that super team too. Super man. team. Cromarte at cornerback and and all these guys. Uh, was uh, was Osimowa still on that team at that point? Yeah, I, I they, think, they had I, just yeah. signed him. Yeah, they and they did. were going to take over the world, and it didn't exactly <laughs> happen. No, good, it good didn't. call, Mason. And the last one on my list for this morning: the Saints need to make a push. Drew Brees not going to live forever. Uh, they, they made some adjustments to the roster. Ravens might have benefited well, from that. What do you but mean you they need w- to make a push? They got to win. They were the Minnesota miracle away from the, the Super- NFC Championship yeah. game. And they would have made it to the Super Bowl. Well, okay. And how many more shots are you going to get at this? Not I'm many. I'm thinking two. Yeah. One, two. I mean, they you got to. Okay. Other than Drew Brees, which given is like the whole team. <laughs> right. <laughs> the defense is starting to look really good. It so is. after Drew Brees, I wouldn't be surprised if they're able to flip it and Sean Payton's an offensive genius, to this defense being able to lead them for a few years. They're a 3680. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. 
Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, the Sports Maven. Bruce is away from the microphone this morning. This is Wayne Viner, along with intern Mason, Danny Cadu behind the glass. We're going to keep it rolling here because, you know, it's football season, and that means that In the Nest is going to start up soon, and that is brought to you by Science and Kirk. And I always kid Bruce that it's like either you just met him yesterday or you've known him for 50 years. The answer is he's known him for about 50 years. And in the 11th year of these Red Turtle Production sports programs here on CBS Sports Radio, Mason, what stands out to you about the, that sort of famous ad read that Bruce does? Yeah, Bruce Soa says, when looking into the background of the persons involved, Science Kirk is the place to go. Absolutely. And Danny, why is that? Well, the cool thing about Science and Kirk is that they have an amazing network of lawyers that they connect with all around the country to find uh, the best lawyer for you and your case. They find lawyers that specialize exactly in uh, your case, and they stay just as invested in it as uh, as always. And you can reach them at 1-800-LAWYERS. You have a lawyer.com. If you have a phone, you have a lawyer. They're an amazing employer as well. I'm, I'm just rapping now. And uh, definitely check out uh, scienceandcurrent.com at youhaveavalawyer.com. You're an amazing employer because you have experience with that. Well, of course. I, I've, I've worked there now for a little bit over six months, thanks to the uh, illustrious host of this show, Bruce Posner. He's uh, Thank you for that, Bruce. He always makes me thank him on the air for that, so thank you. And uh, yeah, it's a wonderful place to work. They gave us a great breakfast yesterday. And good food's always important. <laughs> so I enjoy good food, and I know that Bruce does as well. Uh, joining us for a little different angle on the business of sports and how things really get done is Eric Einhorn. Eric as a UVA guy, we're not going to hold that against him particularly. Uh, went to architecture, went on to the University of Michigan. He is now an AIA certified architect, a lead AP guy, and he owns, runs, operates, and is the lead sports architect for Ball Parkitecture. And in 19 years, he's done 65 sports facilities, worked on 45 campuses. And what's important to me about this is he's worked on the Facilities at Ohio State, Minnesota, Florida, Georgia, and the drawing that a lot of people have seen of what Bird Stadium could become if they ever finish that second deck. Eric has a lot to do with that. Welcome in this morning. Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Wayne. How are you? I'm good. I'm happy. It's almost football season. The Orioles won last night. Uh, We're just things are rolling. Uh, we got Mason here. We've got Danny here. Tell me about. Morning, gentlemen. Tell me about football facilities that you were involved with at Ohio State. How long ago was that, and and how does that relate to with all of these? How does that relate to the personality when they build a structure? Personality, of the coach, of the team, of the administration, or is it just all about football? Well, at Ohio State, worked on the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, or the WAC, as they call it up there off the Olentangy. Um, it was about 10 years ago, probably actually 12 years ago. Um, you know, that was back in the time they were coming off the national championship with Claret. Trestle was the coach. Andy Geiger was the AD. Um, centers, especially where the kind of an operations center, they really reflect the coach's philosophy. And there tends to be two types of coaches I see that I deal with. There's the CEO guy, the guy that wants to be at the end of the hall. He's the last one the athletes see when they're coming through, whether it's day-to-day or through recruiting. Or there's the guy that just wants to be at the center. He's He wants to see you when you first come in, when you're leaving, all his staff coming in and out have to flow through him. And, you know, as with, you know, probably most teams, when you're, when you're building these things around a guy, you know, you change philosophies when you hire a new guy, when things aren't going well with the old guy. So the centers have to change. So at Ohio state, you know, Trestle, he was kind of the CEO guy. He wanted his office at the end of the hall. And that was sort of similar to the guy they got now, um, Urban Meyer. And when Urban, the University of Florida and their center was designed um, that way. 
And I was brought in by Jeremy Foley to take a look at their center when this was a couple of years ago when uh, Jim McElwain was hired. And, you know, his tenure didn't last as long, but he's that guy. He's the opposite. He's not the CEO guy. He's the guy who wants to see everybody. He wants to see all the recruits as soon as they get there, all the players when they're coming in the meetings. And you rework these things, and they tend to happen every five to ten years as staffs change over. For Georgia, we've spoken at length. You've been in there. You're looking at a different way. They, they sort of mesh recruiting with this building, and they're looking at a lot of the new technologies that you can make recruits feel at home. Give us a little bit of insight onto what's the cutting-edge building philosophy for convincing recruits that whatever school this is, is the place for you? Well, yeah, again, looking at that, the University of Georgia doing a study for them for their Bucksmere complex and really took some of that stuff I learned, applied it at the University of Minnesota to the Athletes Village that just opened earlier this year. And using technology to transform the spaces to really tailor them to whatever recruit and whatever sports coming in. So when you enter their lobby, there's these large angled walls with projectors on the ceiling that transform the space. They tailor it. It's just having your tech guy, you know, press his keys, turn on the program to make it all about Minnesota hockey or Minnesota women's basketball or Minnesota football. When you've got a particular targeted recruit coming into your, the facility that day. And the ability to do that versus, let's say, 10 years ago when all your environmental branding and graphics were somewhat static and you had to choose how you wanted to tailor your space if you wanted it to be towards everybody or you wanted to focus more on football because, as we know, in most of collegiate athletics, football's king. That's, what, that's a sport that brings in the revenue that really funds the rest of the programs. But now, um, you know, with video and, you know, just the technologies available, it's amazing what you can do. And you can turn a space over in just seconds. Well, when you're talking now about how everything's changed over the past 10 years with the technology boom, what is the athletic department's view on how to use technology? Do they have one or do you bring that as the consultant? Um, as a design consultant, it's bringing my experience from other places and seeing the trends that are happening. But also with college sports, a lot of it, you know, something gets pushed down from the teams where they go visit. You know, they see what their competitors are doing in the conference, and everyone wants that shiny new toy and wants to outdo the other guys. All right. How much money and, did Minnesota put into this? So the Athletes Village um, is – turned out to be approximately $166 million. And that's for a new indoor football practice facility, a new football operations center, a basketball development center, a nutrition center, an academic center, and a leadership center. And that's sort of comparable in price tag to what the University of Maryland's doing right now with the Cole Fieldhouse project um, that's being phased out over several years where, you know, that started at about $155 million price tag. I heard that's probably jumping. It's going to be about $200 million, I think, when it's all done. Don't hold me to those numbers, but um, you, that's You're, you're fairly accurate. So when Minnesota built that, was it a phase project or did they pay for it all at once or how does that aspect of it work? No, they paid for it all at once. Um, Minnesota's facilities you know, had fallen behind a lot of the Big Ten. They hadn't built much as far as practice and training facilities in a while. They had what I believe was the first indoor football practice facility in the Big Ten, which was built when Lou Holtz was there. Yeah, but they're uh, Minnesota. They called it the Taj Mahal. They, they need that. They, yeah. I, I think that. they need it. Yeah. So they had an indoor, but, you know, the indoor, you know, thinking back when Holtz was there, you know, those spaces, they were just trying to get in out of the cold to have some places to practice when it's cold, when it's snowing. You know, you're in that Midwestern uh, football season. And, you know, what's changed since then is the, you know, building these facilities bigger and wider. So you have the ability, you can play a game there, you can perform all your kicks. They used to, you know, these sheds, you know, as they used to be, were, you know, a little bit below 65 feet, maybe about 50 feet 
in clearance, and in there you can pretty much just pass. Now, you know, over the last five, ten years, there are trends where they're getting up to be 65 feet in clearance where you can have your, you know, you can do field goals, and now looking at a lot of schools are pushing it up to 85 feet plus so that you can punt. And basically it's like a little dome stadium that you can, without the seating, Mm. And you could play a full game in there. Minnesota's got lighting where you could have a broadcast game in there. Um, and they want to simulate as much of game day as possible within these facilities. So you talked about how Minnesota won that indoor practice facility because it was cold. How does the weather affect what you're looking at as an architect or what the school wants? That's where, like, the two big conferences that have had the biggest push in football, the two that have the most amount of money is the Big Ten and the SEC, and they build those facilities for, you know, differing reasons. You know, in the South, it's more for the beginning of the season where you've got all those late summer, early fall, you know, thunderstorms rolling in and you miss practice time. Um, and you're dealing with a lot of HVAC loads potentially just to get it conditioned to a place where it's, you know, it doesn't have to be pristine. You're not living in there for the athletes, but, you know, you want to have some relief from the weather outside where, you know, in the Big Ten, it's more for towards the end of the season where the weather, you know, the grounds, you don't really have like the grass outside because it's all dirt from the practice field from the course of the season and the weather. You know, it's hard to grow at that time of year and you have snow and it's the ability to kind of guarantee practice and, regulate times it's efficient they also these facilities they get used for more than just practice other you know other teams at the university tend to utilize these facilities for their practice they use them as revenue generating spaces on game day they hold tailgates for special alumni groups so they really expand more than just for the football practice aspect well, when you when you were talking about barns to walk through i walked through the Nebraska football practice facility with you. And I take it that was more of your early uh, design, not yours, but an early design of just doing enough that you could play football and have a practice inside. So things have changed dramatically, and we want to have Eric back on Turp Talk because he's been on the field at the new Cole Fieldhouse, and he helped with the stadium design of what is now Maryland Stadium. So, Eric, uh, we're going to have to move on for today. Thank you for joining us. You can find Eric's firm, which is Ballpark Architecture. And if you're looking for Eric online or LinkedIn, uh, Eric, how can somebody locate you? Well, you can find Ballpark Architecture at ballparkarchitecture.com or spelled spelled like it sounds, just with an architecture in the end. So B-A-L-L-P-A-R-C-H-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E.com. Okay, there will be a quiz in the third yeah, segment. country of origin. <laughs> right. um, and you were talking, as we go to break, you were talking about uh, sketching up some stadium designs you're going to share with the Young Terps about the future of stadiums in the D.C. Baltimore metro area. Is that still on? Yeah, Yeah, we'll be getting started with that. Coming up soon, that can be featured on where you can find Jordan and I's TalkRedskins.com, where we talk all about the Redskins. All right. Eric, thanks for being on. This is Coons Ford's Sports Maven this Saturday and every Saturday at 9 a.m. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. Bruce is away from the microphone. He should be back on Wednesday for Turp Talk. This is Wayne Viner, Mason, and Danny here along for the ride this Saturday morning. I want to talk a little bit about Orioles' rebuild before we bring Todd Carton in. I was wa- I'm sorry, but before we talk about that, let's just give a brief mention to Coons Ford, who uh, is the title sponsor of this show. Uh, Bruce has been buying cars from Coons for, uh, he says he's, he's, he says he's bought almost 100 cars. Uh, I know it's over 40. Yeah, so I mean, and, I mean the, the way that he talks about it, it seems like the, the fish story gets better, bigger every every week, but obviously him and uh, Mr. Kowatsis have an amazing rapport, and uh, apparently... 
Coons Ford has, speaking of free food, an amazing lunch platter. Oh, absolutely. We've uh, had yeah, that. Yeah, We've yeah. been there. I mean, pe- people want to go just for lunch. I mean, they, they, it they, works. They, they, they do some, they have some eye candy out there with some cars to look at, but really you're there for, you're there for the lunch. So uh, check out Coons Ford, CoonsFord.com. And uh, they thank you for uh, sponsoring the show. And when you go out there, uh, ask for Dennis. They have a new Ford Mustang Bullet, which is a hard car to get a hold of. If you're into Mustangs, you got to go out and see the Bullet that's that's out in front of the dealership. And you know that Dennis is going to have them, too. They're going to have them, yeah, because they get the top cars, top allotment, because they are one of the largest volume Ford dealers on this planet. In the universe. Let's Absolutely. go there. Absolutely. So go out, at least go out for lunch. Uh, Dennis yeah. brings the food, man. Did Coons you like Ford having lunch there? Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Yeah, it was a, it was a great great experience that we had there. Checked out the Mustang, great car. All right, Orioles. Dan Duquette was on during the the rain the other night. Yeah, he was for a while. That was for impressive. A, yeah, it was. Uh, and for the twenty or so minutes he was on, about sixteen of it was new. By the time he got to the end, he did a little bit of rehashing. <laughs> That's what he does. But that was. <laughs> Refreshing. A, refreshing. I actually feel like I heard the, a little bit of the truth that they had, to, to summarize his 20 minutes, they had come to the end of the road with this. They're going to rebuild. He hopes to be here to do the rebuild. He's not even sure he's going to be here. He's at the end of the contract. Danny, you're a lot closer to this than we are because you, you cover the team. Um, what did you take from Dan's statements? Um, I, I just want to say before I go on, and uh, it's, it's not overly positive, but I just want to say it's... It, the word is refreshing, and regardless of what you feel about Dan Duquette and the way that he uh, has apparently, I mean, you, you want to believe that he's the person who's been the point man for this organization for the last four or five years. Uh, I, I think it was just really nice to hear it all said out loud, because everyone, especially on this show, we've, we've been talking about it for the better part of a year and a half now, about how much all these moves were needed, and better late than never, right? But at the same time, it's still very, very late, and um, the... The most reassuring uh, development, I think, of the last week and a half, despite the trade of Manny, despite the trade of Zach Burton, both of those things needed to happen. For me, it was the fact that they look like they are the presumptive favorites to sign this top international prospect, Victor Victor Mesa Jr. from Cuba. And yeah, two victors, twice twice the, the excitement of an international signing. And twice the victor. Yeah, exactly. All the value. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and if people have been following the Orioles over the last few years, they've basically been trading away their international slot money like yes. like hotcakes, basically. They, uh, they, why they didn't want it, I don't know. But he said they want to go into this market. Dan right. Duquette said exactly. they want to go and, into and, this and market. He, and he said that during the uh, press conference after they traded Manny last week. And I thought that there was the that was the most refreshing thing to hear. But then you looked, and uh, BaseballAmerica.com still had their, their tracker. And there was only one team in all of baseball who still had not signed an international prospect. Now, it looks like if, they, if they're signing the top one available, that would be the the ultimate change of the guard moment. So in that regard, I'm very happy. I think the fact of the matter is Dan Duquette is not going to be here. So I think that uh, him doing all this messaging is a nice way for him to uh, repair his uh, his reputation a little bit on the way out. But I do not see uh, this uh, front office regime staying. Okay. Well, we need to get to Todd here. Okay. Well, I just, got, I just got but, one more. But Mason, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead, Mason. Um, so you said it's better late than ever. When do you think they should have made the trade for these prospects? Last year at the deadline, I right. think. N- n- not necessarily the winter meetings after they made the playoffs, but as soon as you knew that they weren't going to make the playoffs last year, that was when you had to. Uh, the, the top prospects now listed for the Orioles is Diaz, a center fielder they brought in from the Dodgers. Uh, Ryan Mountcastle, that while in the break, uh, Danny said, as a bat, might not have a position, which I think is right now one of the big problems with the Orioles. You, you can't have everybody without an actual position. I think Mancini is somebody you're going to hold on to. Uh, he's got some upside, but you can't have Mancini and Trumbo in the outfield in a major league team that's on the field. So, But uh, with Austin Hayes and Cedric Mullins who are, and Diaz, who are top-level outfielders, bring them in would be a great upgrade to that defense. We're going to bring in Todd and talk about fall sports here for a few minutes. Todd, welcome in this morning. Thank you, Wayne. Always a pleasure. So I was looking at the schedule for the non-rev sports and the soccer, men's soccer schedule for early early season is fantastic. But what are your biggest takeaways from the fall sports upcoming schedule? 
Well, right now, I you know, it, it, it's hard to believe, Wayne, but it's two weeks from Thursday is the, the first game of the quote-unquote fall sports season with women's soccer playing uh, down at William & Mary and then on the, the, the following Sunday. So that's the 16th of August. This is supposed to be a fall sport. The 16th of August, everybody starts, with the exception of football, which starts on the 1st of September, Everybody else starts sometime in August. Um, and you're right about, about the men's soccer. I, you know, they start out at Washington uh, in, uh, on the West Coast, but then the next week they come home and they play Stanford. They host Stanford, who is, of course, the defending national champion. And that is going to be one of those super large crowds at Ludwig Field. That's the last weekend in August, so they play soccer Friday night against Stanford, and then Maryland plays Texas in football on Saturday, and then soccer comes back on Monday against Virginia at New Audi Field. Mason, what do you think of that Audi Field? Have you seen, uh, gotten a good look at that? Yeah, it looks really great. They did have a nice crowd of assault of capacity the other night to open it up, and I'm expecting a big crowd from Maryland, Virginia. You think they can put 20,000 people in there, Todd? For Maryland, Virginia, I'd be shocked if they do that yeah honestly i i think if if they can get uh six or eight thousand down there i i think it'll be an, a nice uh, achievement for maryland at that point i don't know how many people will come up from virginia but you know i mean ludwig will get eight thousand but that's that's with the the crew out there and and frankly those guys start tailgating middle of the afternoon usually on friday and um doing some things that that college students like to do and probably shouldn't be doing well that that's good uh, what do you see for field hockey well field hockey field hockey is really interesting to me because it's it's sort of the flip side of soccer in terms of what happened last season you know soccer the men's soccer team sasha's team had had a great start to the season they were undefeated for a long time and then they just collapsed at the end of the season they they lost what uh six of the last they they lost five straight to end end the season and then lost in the shootout in the first round of the ncaa um they only scored i think two goals in the last over the last six games something like that field hockey went exactly Exactly the opposite way. They started out one and two, and then won ten of their last twelve, and ran all the way to the national championship. And they'll be exciting too. Get it getting started early. Um, they have an exhibition on the sixteenth of August. Their first game is the the twenty sixth. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the twenty fourth. They're out on the west coast also to start, and then on the thirty first of August, the same weekend that we're talking about soccer and and football, they're hosting hosting the ACC uh, Cup, the Big 10 ACC Challenge, effectively, in field hockey, and they'll play Boston College and Duke. So, Todd, this week we heard something out of the Save UMD Golf Course campaign that the university had a meeting and they're planning to demolish a golf course for a new track and field complex. Yeah, well... (laughs) We'll we'll see. You know, I mean, they they they've talked about the golf course in in the past. Uh, this is not the first time they've thrown out the idea of, of demolishing the golf course. You know, a track and field complex makes sense only if they're going to build Sasho his. Frankly, if they're going to build Sasho his soccer stadium, to me, and and if they're going to expand that that uh, field at Ludwig and improve there. Do you think lacrosse would end up moving into the new Ludwig Field? Um, you know that's a, that's a really good question because they 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 want to play those games on different surfaces. Lacrosse, I think, prefers to play on an artificial surface of some kind, which you have in Maryland near Bird Stadium, and and soccer mm-hmm. obviously only wants to play on on natural turf. Um, so that's something to be seen. I think it's probably a, a decent idea to move move the uh, lacrosse team into that facility. But then again, I think the lacrosse team is going to move into the Gossett area Absolutely. when when foot 
That, that's fault. what I've seen on the drawings. Todd, we're running out of time here. Thank you for being on this morning. We will pick this back up on Turp Talk on Wednesday night. Thanks for listening to Coons Ford Sports Maven. Bruce will be back for Turp Talk on Wednesday. This is Wayne Viner. This is Mason Viner. And that is... Danny Cadu, sure. And we will see you next Saturday here on the Sports Maven.